Hello, everyone. May the Lord richly bless you. We're so thankful to be back with you. Um, we're going to continue on speaking on the Godhead. This will be part four, and we'll go about 30 minutes here. Trust in the Lord will be with us. We'll speak to you, and we'll deal with you. We know God deals by revelation. Um, he doesn't deal by magic. He doesn't deal by um, just dropping something in our minds, but he works through the Word, he works through ministers, he works through our own personal study and prayer time, and through those things, the revelation is made known to us. So, we're looking to him, trusting in him that, you know, some part of this will help you in your journey and in your walk, but let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we look to you, you are God of gods and Lord of lords and King of kings, and we put our faith and confidence in you, Lord ask that you each lead each one that's listening to this, Lord, that if, if there's someone that uh, can't see what we're talking about or disagrees with us or believes in, in, in uh, Trinitarian or Jesus-only doctrine, we ask, Lord, that you would just help them to understand, um, give them a revelation, Lord. Help me to speak clearly uh, and, and, and not be confusing about it, Lord. May your hand be upon us in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So last time we ended with, I wanted to go through the Old Testament uh, promises of the Messiah so we can see the identity of Jesus of Nazareth more clearly. So the first prophecy in the Old Testament that we see is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. This is the curse upon the serpent. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise thy his heel. So here we have a prophecy of the seed of the woman. The seed of the woman is going to bruise the head of the seed of the serpent. But the seed of the serpent is going to bruise the heel of our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ, the Messiah. So we have the head of the devil being crushed, and we have the heel of the Messiah being crushed. So through this bruising of the heel of the Messiah, we have redemption, because when his heel is bruised, the works, the head, the mind, the revelation of Satan is going to be destroyed. So here we have... The Messiah is referred to as the seed of the woman. So she, he's going to come through. He's going to be a man born of a woman. That's the first prophecy. Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 18. Now, the, in one sense, this scripture refers to every prophet's pr prophet, but the reality is uh, it, it's specifically referring to the Messiah. Uh, verse 15 of Deuteronomy 18. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken, according to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more, that I die not. And the Lord said unto me, They have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. So Messiah is going to be a prophet like Moses, a deliverer, a leader, and it says he'll, he'll be of thy brethren. So he's going to be raised up amongst the Jewish people. It'll be of thy brethren. So he'll be a person that's raised up as a Jew amongst the Jews. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 14. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, and with the stripes of the children of men." So here it's telling us that the Messiah is going to be a king and he's going to be, uh, be the son of God. 
So this is fulfilled in Luke one thirty five. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So here, Son of God in one place means being the chosen king. Another place we see Son of God speaks of his conception by the Holy Ghost. It says, He'll be called the Son of God because the Holy Ghost overshadowed the Virgin Mary. Not because he was a pre-existing second person of the Godhead, but because the Holy Ghost overshadowed her and brought forth the man, the Son of God. Psalm 2.7, another reference to the Son of God. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. So, this day have I begotten thee. Not in eternity, but a day in time and history is when the Son of God will be begotten. Not eternally begotten. Remember, Son assumes beginning. So, the Son of God has a beginning, and this scripture says, this day, so there's a day and time in history where Jesus is born, fulfilled in Matthew 1.18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, the birth of Jesus Christ. This is from the word Genesis, the beginning. The beginning of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. So Jesus had his beginning in the womb of a virgin when he was, she was found with child by the Holy Ghost. Now another scripture people use, uh, this is, becomes a controversy, Psalm 110 verse 1, but it's a scripture that uh, the Apostle Peter used in the, the inaugural sermon on the day of Pentecost, and it's an important scripture that's a messianic scripture. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So what is, it, what is it saying here? Yahweh, Jehovah, spoke to the Messiah. Yahweh, the invisible, eternal God, spoke to Messiah, the Lord Messiah. God spoke to Jesus. Uh, I don't know how else to, <laughs> to say it. But it's Yahweh and Adonai. So in the Old Testament, the Jews took the term Yahweh and turned it from Yahweh to Adonai, A-D-O-N-A-I. Uh, there's another word for Lord, which is always used for a, hu a human Lord, and that's Adonai, A-D-O-N-E-E. -E. Uh, we find an example of this in 1 Samuel 24, verse 8. David also arose afterwards and went out of the cave and cried after Saul, saying, My Lord, the King. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed himself. So here we have David saying to his, his human Lord, to Saul, My Lord. So another place, Psalm 110, The Lord said unto my Lord. Whose Lord? David's Lord. So speaking of the Messiah, the son of David, as the Lord of David. So how is, that, how is that possible? It's because he's the son of God. Not merely the son of David, literally the son of David from his actual uh, physical lineage, but he came through the lineage of, of David, and yet he wasn't the son of David. He was the son of God by virgin birth. So here, here's a verse that's clearly used as two lords, but the New Testament says there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So there's not two lords, there's Yahweh, the great eternal spirit, and there's my Lord, the man Christ Jesus, the Son of God. So right hand of God, it refers there, it's not as though as God is on throne and his right hand there's Jesus. Um, it refers to the power, majesty, and glory of God. Jesus is the mercy of and power of God. Uh, all Jesus said, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. So Jesus is at the right hand of power, right hand of majesty, right hand of glory. He is the very mercy, majesty, and glory of God made manifested in human flesh. So we, ha we have here 
again, uh, I, we don't want to dismiss this scripture. The Lord said unto my, oh, that's the two Lord scripture. <laughs> as far as I know, there's no such a thing as a two Lord. There's just scripture. This is a Bible verse. Um, we should look at it plainly and clearly and understand it plainly and clearly. So Yahweh is invisible. My Lord, the Messiah, is the visible manifestation of the invisible Yahweh. So when we're looking at the throne of God and we see a human shape, what are we actually really seeing? We're seeing God himself. Uh, we're, we're seeing God himself in the form of Jesus Christ, in the face of Jesus Christ. And so, again, Scripture speaks of two here, Yahweh and my Lord. We're not going to try to run from that or, 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 or take it away. There's Yahweh and there's Messiah. There's the invisible one and the visible one. Uh, Psalm 2, verse 2, The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, Yahweh, and against His anointed, or in other words, Messiah. So they set themselves together against Yahweh and Messiah. Isaiah 11, 2, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Okay, so the spirit of the Lord comes upon the Messiah. Messiah means to be anointed. Anointed with what? Anointed with the spirit of God. In Isaiah 11, 2, it says the spirit of Yahweh. Acts 10, 38 shows us how this was fulfilled how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Again, we, we covered this before. Trinitarians will take this verse. God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost. So, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. <laughs> Three persons visible in this verse. Again, who was dwelling in Jesus? The Holy Ghost or God the Father? Jesus said, He that has seen me has seen the Father. It's not me that does the works, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. So who is doing the works? The Holy Ghost? Peter says the Holy Ghost. Jesus says the Father. Which one is it? They're both correct, but they're both looking at it from a different angle. God the Father is a spirit. God is the Holy Ghost. God the Father is the Holy Ghost. God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost, with His own Spirit, with His own power, with His own grace. Jesus was anointed with it. So Messiah means to be anointed with the Spirit of Jehovah. Isaiah 42, 1, Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my Spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. So the Messiah is elect. He was chosen by God before the foundation of the world. And he was chosen to be born and to be anointed with the Holy Spirit and to be the visible expression and manifestation of Yahweh. Isaiah 9.6 For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. So, speaking of the children of Israel, unto us a child is born. He's a child and a son is given. He's a son. He's a man. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. All titles of Almighty God. But I want you to notice, his name shall be called. So, what was the name of Elijah? What does that mean? Elijah. God is Yahweh. What does Joshua mean? Jehovah Savior. Um... Let's think of some other names. Isaiah, this has the name of God in it. Um, we can go on and on. These different names uh, have the name of God in it. So what is it saying? The prophets were a part of the Word, revealing and manifesting. We'll say it like the way Brother Branham said. They were the veil that God hid behind, in part. Jesus is the veil that God hid behind in fullness. So these are all titles of Almighty God. John 1.14 says, And the Word was made flesh. The Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten 
of the Father full of grace and truth. We beheld the glory in the ministry of Jesus Christ. When you saw that man, you were seeing the glory of God. No, there wasn't anything radiating of him, but when you had a revelation of who he is, you knew you were seeing God in human flesh. So, God became human. Sometimes this is uh, hard to understand. Remember we described before, God is apart from his creation. He, he, he's separate from it. He dwells in a dimension outside of the dimensions that we dwell in in flesh here. He, he's in another dimension completely. So God is apart and separate. He's a spirit that covers all space and time. He can dwell in men all around the world, and he's still one spirit, one God. But God put his life in a little body, took from himself, from the Logos. Out from the Logos came a life that was born as a baby. The Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary and created a little embryo within her. Both sperm and egg were created by God. He had to be born outside of the nature of sin. If he would have had Mar been born of Mary's egg and God's created sperm, then we ha have a situation where uh, uh, the Messiah is going to be tainted by the original sin. Mary had to be saved, called, called God her Savior. She wasn't sinless. She needed to be saved from her sins. And, and so she, was being a sinner, would have patched, passed the nature of sin onto the Lord Jesus. But So God had to create both sperm and egg and put that inside as an embryo uh, attached to the placenta of Mary. Jesus was the last Adam. 1 Corinthians 15.45 says that. He was a direct creation of God in a virgin, just as Adam was a direct creation of God from the dust. The scripture says the word became flesh. The exp express image of God was born. When you looked at that baby, yes, it, that baby was the Son of God, but when you looked at that Son of God, you were looking at God. That can't be said of me. That can't be said of you. Yes, in part, but not in fullness, not complete expression. I want you to see Jesus receive worship, Matthew 2.11. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child and Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts and gold and frankincense and myrrh. Um, they worshipped him. Now let's look at Jesus as a 12-year-old boy. And Jesus, Luke 2.52 and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Jesus, as a 12-year-old boy, was in the temple. He was speaking to the priests after the Passover. They were amazed at his wisdom. So Luke 2.52, And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and men. 1 Samuel 2.26 says the same about Samuel. And the ch child Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. Jesus was the same. Jesus was born with human limitations. Jesus needed to grow in wisdom. He, he needed to grow. He was a man. He was a perfect man. He was a sinless man. As a man, he had the divine nature. So when God... Whose DNA was Jesus? The DNA of God, the Son of God. So when you were looking at Jesus, that was God. The very DNA of God in human flesh. Matthew three sixteen and 17, and we've looked at it multiple occasions, and I want to look at it again. Very important. The anointed Messiah. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So we have the Spirit of God descending from heaven, and a voice speaking from heaven. So Jesus was not anointed until the age of 30. 
The Spirit of the Father did not dwell in him until this time. Colossians 2, verse 9, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. John 10, verse 30, I and my Father are one. John 14, 10, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. The invisible Father who is Spirit came to dwell in his Son at thirty years of age at the river Jordan. God come down and dwelt in human flesh. Then in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus praying, Luke 22, 24, for, uh, Luke twenty two forty two, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove, remove this cup from me, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Jesus in prayer, saying, Lord, if there's another way to do this, please let it be so. But if not, I'm willing to go and do it. Jesus was making his will conformable to his Father's will. And Brother Branham tells us that at this time, God was putting the sins of the world on Jesus and he took the anointing away from him. Brother Branham says he had to die as a man. God cannot die, and Jesus couldn't go there, go to the, to the place uh, as God. He had to go as a man, our kinsman redeemer. Jesus was both God and man, both man and God. John eight fifty eight. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. So remember, He's telling them, I'm, e I'm the eternal one. What does it mean? Because Jesus had a beginning. He was born of the Virgin Mary. But that spirit dwelling within him had no beginning and no end. And even beyond that, Jesus was the invisible expression of Almighty God. So when that burning bush was there and told Moses, I am that I am, what was that? That was the Logos. That was Jesus. Later became Jesus. Luke 2.52, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. God cannot grow in wisdom. God cannot increase in favor with God. God is God. He's in favor with himself already. But Jesus was a man. He was a human being. And yet Jesus said he was the I Am. So we need to take all these things in balance. We can't take one and dismiss the other. We need to be believers we need to take the whole thing. John 5.19, Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. So the Son can do nothing of himself. He, God did the works in the Son. So there's a dual nature there. Fully God, fully man. God revealed perfectly in a human body, and yet that body was completely human, and that, that human body lived in submission to God and did the works of God. Remember, Jesus in Isaiah 9 6 is called the everlasting Father, the mighty God, etc. So, that Je Jesus had the very authority, had the very titles of Almighty God placed upon him. Who was Jesus? God manifested in the flesh. Yes, he was the Son of God. Yes, he was the Messiah. Yes, he was the Lord. All these things together, we have to take the whole scripture, the whole message. Both man and God. As a man, he was tempted by the devil. He hungered for food. He got tired. He wept. Uh, he died. Uh, People looked at him and said, you're not over 50 years old, but you have seen Abraham? <laughs> he was God because he overcame by the word. He fed 5,000. He was the bread of life. He rebuked the storm. He raised the dead. He rose from the dead. He said, before Abraham was, I am. He said, I am the bread of life. I am the rock in the wilderness. These things... Jesus didn't say, I'm speaking in the name of the Father. Thus saith the Lord, I am the rock in the wilderness. Never said, thus saith the Lord. Why? Because he was the Lord. 
He never prefaced that I'm speaking of someone else. He was taking the titles and prerogative of God and putting them on himself. He says, you as a man are making yourself equal with God. They charged him with that. And he stepped back and said, you call those whom the word of the Lord comes to gods. Why do you say, I have sinned because I call myself the Son of God? So as the Son of God, he took upon himself the titles and the prerogative of deity. 1 Timothy 3.16 Great is the mystery of godliness, for God was manifest in the flesh. At the cross, Jesus said this, Matthew 27, 46, About the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Forsaken means to leave behind or desert someone. That's why Brother Branham says the anointing left him. If the anointing was still in them, in him, the Father was still in him. But Jesus said, God, you've forsaken me. You've left me because the sins of the world were placed upon the Lord Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God placed our sins upon the Son and because of that, God left him. That anointing left him. He was forsaken. He died alone because of our, your sin and my sin. We are saved actually by the blood of God. Did you know the scripture tells us that? Acts twenty twenty eight. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. So God left Jesus and yet he was the vessel that was the tabernacle of God, and therefore it was God's blood. So when, when I am born, my parents are Jim and Susan. So I'm, I am the life of Jim and Susan in human flesh. So their DNA together. So I have half of my father's DNA, half of my mother's DNA. So when you're looking at me, I'm the son of James and Susan. So I have the life of son of James and Susan inside of me. Jesus, whose DNA was he? He was the DNA of God. He was the blood of God. So when Jesus shed his blood, that was the very life and blood of God that was being sacrificed for your sin and for my sin. Brother Branham says in the sermon, the token... That's exactly what he was. We handled God, the Bible said. 1 Timothy 3.16 Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. We handled him with our hands. That body was God. It certainly was. He was God all over in the form of a human being. Amen. God's gifts always find their places. Jesus was God in the form of a man. That's hard for people to swallow. He was nothing less than God. He was God manifest in flesh. He was the creator in his own creation. Philippians 2, 6 through 8. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Form that word form there, the form of God, is morphe. And the, it means the form by which a person or thing strikes the vision. So what was Jesus? He was the person or thing by which God strikes the vision. He was God made visible. And God became subject to death was born in the form of the likeness of men, became obedient even unto death. That was, our, that was God himself that did that. The form of God. In the sermon, God's gift finds, always find their places. 1963, Brother Branham says, You see, Jesus was God. He was not no third person, fourth person, second person. He was the person he was God. See, he was God, Emmanuel. God come down from glory, revealed himself. I'm just going to close with that quote, and we'll start up again. 
and cover that in more detail. So praise the Lord for His goodness. I'm so thankful for this Word. It keeps us in line. It keeps us in balance. It keeps us growing and increasing in faith all the time. So for those of you who are listening, we want to pray. We want to thank you for for listening in. We hope you're blessed. If you have questions, let us know in the comment section uh, on Facebook, YouTube, or our website. We love you, and we'll pray now. Father, we look to you. Believers are listening to this that need healing, that need provision. Lord, would you do something supernatural and almighty in their behalf? May they just reach their hands up to heaven, Lord, making their request known to you. Lord, you will do it. You will provide for that, Lord. You will bring that healing that's needed, Father. You will bring the solution to the problem that's needed. We commit each one into your hands for your glory in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless you.